Welcome to the Writing Western Podcast. I'm your host, Brennan Rensink. Today we talk with author Deborah Gwartney about her book, I Am a Stranger Here Myself, a combination history of Narcissa Whitman and a personal memoir about her growing up and belonging in Idaho and the West. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Rudd Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. Each episode features a conversation with an author or scholar of new works that explore the North American West. We hope that our discussions will spark your curiosity to learn more and think differently about the North American West as a region and its peoples, environments, histories, literature, and so forth. You can follow Writing Westward on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or on Twitter at Writing West. You can listen on our website, writingwestward.org, or subscribe and listen wherever you get your podcasts. We're listed on most major distributors. To learn more about the Red Center, our programming, live streamed lectures, funding opportunities for research and events, or anything else, find us at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D-Center.byu.edu. You can get more regular updates about the Red Center on Facebook and Twitter as well. Thanks for listening. Deborah Gwartney is an award-winning author and memoirist who writes about the American West and also teaches in the MFA program at Pacific University in Western Oregon. Her book, I Am a Stranger Here Myself, was published by the University of New Mexico Press in 2019 and won the River Teeth Literary Nonfiction Prize. The book is part 19th century history and part personal memoir. In 1847, the Presbyterian missionary Narcissa Whitman was killed, along with her husband and others, at their Whitman mission near Walla Walla, Washington, by Cayuse Indians they had been trying to convert for years. She'd been the first Caucasian woman to cross the Rocky Mountains, and had struggled to make the interior Pacific Northwest her home and a place where she belonged. Gwartney uses Narcissa's story to pry open her own personal history of being born in the small mountain town of Salmon, Idaho, in a family that prided itself in being quintessentially Western in the most rugged Old West ways. Gwartney had always felt out of place in her family's West, even though she remained fiercely loyal to and in love with the region and Salmon, Idaho. Moving back and forth between Narcissa's story and her own life, Courtney ponders what it means to belong in the West, maybe to belong to the West, what it means to be a Westerner, and how all of that is changing as we age and develop along with the region. Courtney wrestles with belonging, identity, and coming to peace with the tensions that might exist between the places we most feel at home and the identities they try to impose upon us. Her beautifully written book entreats us to ask these same questions of our own Western lives. Deborah Gwartney, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you for having me so much. I believe it was uh, your press. I think New Mexico actually sent this book to me out of the blue and said, we really think this would be a good fit for the podcast. And I'm really glad they did. You are more of the the literary genre than I usually uh, dip into myself. So it was a real treat to have this brought to my attention. Oh, thank you for reading it. I want to talk um, first about memoir. That is perhaps mm-hmm. what you're most famous for. Well, <laughs> famous. Oh, that's a funny word. But uh, <laughs> I, I've been teaching it, teaching memoir for over 20 years. And my first book was a memoir. And of course, this is kind of a memoir hybrid. Um, yeah. But I'm super interested in memoir. It's probably what I've read the most, thought about the most, studied intently. What do you think makes for a good versus a bad memoir? What are the the key things? Well, I have many opinions on that. Just ask my students. But um, I was lucky enough to study in graduate school with uh, people I feel like shaped the idea of memoir right now. Philip Lopate being the central one and uh, Vivian Gornick. She's actually she's probably more even central to memoir than than Philip Lopate. Uh, And they really shaped my sense of what this genre is. And I think Vivian Gornick says it so well when in her book, The Situation in the Story, when she talks about how all memoir seeks to answer the same question, who am I? It's such a genre about this self-excavation and the seeking of um, self-awareness. I I would when Philip Lopate finished my first book, he said that to me, he said, I'm I'm so glad that you recognize that all memoir in the end is about self-awareness. Um, so I don't really think you can write a memoir about 
other people. I, I see all the time I'm writing a memoir about my mother or whatever. Hmm. And I think, well, no, you can write a biography of your mother or a profile of your mother or a, or a, even a nonfiction narrative about your mother. But memoir is really about the person called I. And the, of, of course, other characters can be rich and well developed, but in the end, the stakes belong to the person called I. Does this make it perhaps different than an autobiography? Cause yes. When I think autobiography, I think you're trying to set in stone mm -hmm. the official, um, more objective narrative. Where, mm -hmm. Whereas memoir, if it's about self-discovery and answering the question of who am I, mm -hmm. that, you know, how I would answer those questions now versus 20 years ago versus how I might answer them 20 years in the future could be three mm -hmm. very different memoirs. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Uh, which is why people write more than one memoir, I guess. But uh, I think with autobiography, yes, it's a it's about a life, and um, memoir for me is about a search. You know, it's a it's in the again in the situation in the story, Vivian Gornick writes a line that says uh, the, the reader expects to understand that the narrator is going on a journey of discovery. And when I first read that, I thought, oh yeah, duh, that's so easy. But then. It, now I, I see that as one of the most challenging lines in that book. So how do you convince the reader that you are truly going on a, on a journey to discover the self? It's very tricky writing and, and asks everything of you, I think. You have to be more vulnerable when you're writing writing that way. You're kind of handing some of the authority over to the reader also. Um, Interesting, yes. In a way. I also think that, you know, this makes me think that memoir also, if as a reader of a memoir, I'm reading your journey of self-discovery, but more so than autobiography would, it probably is going to make the reader pause and think about their own life in new ways oh, and ask yes. questions. Isn't that what then the best memoir should do is to oh, yes. make us self-reflect as a reader as well? Absolutely. I think the the memoirs that I hold so dear to me are the ones that really awakened me to myself. And um, and because, you know, they don't there's no investment in self-pity or victimization. The, 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 the memoir isn't written about blame or castigation, but truly, how am I a player, not a victim? And some of my students really object to that idea of player. It's overstated. But what I'm trying to get to is you also have a role in this dynamic. And the memoir is the genre to discover that role in the dynamic of your family, of your of your marriage of, of your workplace you know it's it's not a complaint it's a discovery hmm. i've done a lot of writing uh i've been a journaler i've written a lot mm. of music and songs most of which was autobiographical mm. and i've always thought oh writing a memoir would be so fun but the more i think about it the more terrifying the prospect becomes <laughs> i don't know if i'll ever be that brave <laughs> i commend you fun, for though. your bravery <laughs> <laughs> well thank you what makes um for a good western memoir or what makes mm. a memoir Western? This is a Western podcast. Mm -hmm. And as we'll get to your, your, uh, th this book, which actually we haven't even said the name of yet. Um, I am a stranger here myself, um, is very much about you and your place in the West and mm. the West's place in you and in your life. Um, mm -hmm. are there key things that you think or that, that are compelling to you as you read at Western, be it biographies, autobiographies or memoirs? Sure, that's uh, that's a great question too. I, you know, I, I read a lot of uh, scholarly works for this piece, especially Patricia Limerick, um, who just mm -hmm. does such a good job of casting the West in a particular frame that um, helped me understand my own dilemma about the West. And I also have to say that the whole um, Bundy situation down in in uh, Oregon, where, mm -hmm. you know, where I live, uh, Eastern Oregon, it really stirred a lot of thinking in me, too. Like, what's going on in the West these days and how does it cast back to the early days? So they you know, were very much self-presenting themselves uh -huh. um, as very kind of Western figures. There was a lot of sure it, image, I think, intentional imagery there. Intentional. Sure. It's a the frontier West comes back to life. Uh, they were the vigilantes, the, yeah. you know, the. um the cowboys riding into town. So, um, yeah, they, the, and, and the whole idea of public lands and grazing and, you know, all these issues, uh, just lit a fire in me. And I thought, what's going on in the West these days? And yeah, I was pretty upset when the Bundys walked away with, with no punishment. 
basically, you know, from that whole situation. And I thought something is shifting here that I'm um, super interested in, in terms of my own family and my own history in the West. So that was one of my, one, one thing that led me to books like, you know, I read Stegner again and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, just tried to look back on some of those early Western writings by women, Mary Austin and, uh, that, oh gosh, I'm forgetting her name, the one woman who writes about the woman, the first lady in the Rocky Mountains. I'll have to look her up. But anyway, I, I, uh, I did try to tap back into some of those earlier writings about the West. And, um, I think what I have been thinking, what, what came to me the most about all of this is that when the West was first shaped as a place, you know, as a, as an American United States region, it, it came with certain ideals, certain promises for people. Um, and, you know, we still kind of cling to that mythology and to what, to, to what, what's the benefit of clinging to it and how is it hurting us? And that was my central question about the West itself. I happened to read then that book Prairie Fires by, about, uh, the, you know, the woman who wrote Little House on the Prairie. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, and I was astonished at how many issues there in that book were just emulated what was going on in the West with Manifest Destiny. I didn't realize that settlers were promised the world, you know, come here, we'll give you land and no, but no, no Indians will bother you. And um, and people did that. And then it was, you know, often catastrophic. Yeah. Um and I thought the West was kind of unique in that dilemma, but it turns out that it was happening in other parts of the country too, even Florida, Wisconsin, you know, Michigan. Um, yeah, all these kind of, a lot of settler frontiers had the, yeah. similar things. Right. But maybe nobody had that kind of frontier spirit like the, um, the Northwest and particularly the Pacific Northwest where I live because, um, there was such a dispute with the British about who owned this region and, you know, that had to be settled before um, people could really move in and be comfortable here. Yeah. I grew up in the Northwest as well. And I've always felt that it's somewhat off the map, Mm -hmm. I think for most Americans, but even uh, for a Mm -hmm. lot of scholars of the the West more broadly, uh, Mm -hmm. the Pacific Northwest is, is sometimes in a category of its own. And then um, I mean, where a lot of your book takes place, the interior Pacific Northwest mm-hmm. is even a further black hole that very few people have ever ventured into, <laughs> you know, uh, be, be so it, uh, personally or, you know, in, in a scholarly way. Oh, um, it's so true. I mean, people, I, even now when I people, I tell people I'm from Idaho, they say Iowa, uh, <laughs> you know, they, uh, people ha- have trouble even wrapping their heads around a place called Idaho. Yeah. But um, it's, it, uh, that's very interesting to me. I also think that, um, you know, my my husband, who's a writer, pointed out to me once that the Pacific Northwest or really the whole West had had no involvement in industrialization and no involvement in the Civil War. So, you know, we this region was really set aside in that way from the rest of the country. And, and it, you know, gave it a different flavor and a different um, cast, I think. Mm. Interesting. I'm going to have to think about that one for a while. Mm. <laughs> think back on my childhood a bit. So in your book, you, you present your your early years and your personal life growing up in Idaho. Mm. And then you pair that, you bounce back and forth between that and the story of the Whitmans and Narcissa Whitman, you know, uh, a century mm-hmm. and a half um, earlier. Um, mm-hmm. What is it that makes um, Idaho unique for for you as opposed to, well, I guess, you know, you live in Western Oregon, west of Portland, right? Um, which right. is still the West and you live in kind of, uh, I mean, I'm assuming you, uh, where you are there and, uh, is it Forest Grove? What's the, where's Pacific University? No, I'm actually in, oh yeah, that's, I teach there, but I actually live on the Mackenzie River, which is, um, between, uh, it's between Eugene and Sisters mm. up in the McCaskade Mountains. Well, that actually might be more, uh, similar to Salmon, Idaho than I had thought then. Um, can you describe uh, what Salmon, Idaho, is like? This, this is where you, where you uh, where you grew up, or where you were your family is from. Right, where my family is from. I was born there and, and spent a lot of time there. Um, 
and my grandparents, my great grandparents, all my aunts and uncles live there. Uh, it is a mountain town for sure up in the Bitterroots. It's, you know, it's not Sun Valley, even though it's about two, two and a half hours from Sun Valley straight up the mountains. Um, it, you know, from my aunt's house, you can, aunt's backyard, you can see the continental divide. It's, you know, this massive mountains surrounding uh, the, the uh, whole little town. It's, it's so gorgeously beautiful. It's, it's really breathtaking every day, even if you've been there a thousand times. And the Salmon River runs right through the middle of it. Um, so it is a small town. I think there were 3,000 people in it when I was born, and I think there are 3,000 people there now. Hmm. So it doesn't really shift very much unless there's a gold mine that's – I saw – I still get the Salmon Idaho newspaper, and I saw that a big cobalt mine is opening. So that will create an influx. Bring in some people, yeah. Yeah, so it's a mining area for sure, and uh, lots of – it's extremely conservative, and my family – there is extremely conservative, not religious, my family, but conservative mm -hmm. in politics. So that's where I was born in this small town um, in a very conservative mindset, um, which has become increasingly, to my mind, more libertarian over time mm -hmm. um, and very much Trump supporters. So one of my questions to myself was, how did I come out of that? Because I consider myself a feminist a progressive. Um, I'm, I don't swing as far left as my father fears that I do, but, um, <laughs> but I am left leaning. And, um, you know, so I, I thought, how did I f form those ideas out of this upbringing of mine? That was one place I wanted to start. Yeah. Cause you write that you, you always felt somewhat out of place, um, be it there, you know, geographically or with the family, with some of those ideas about, uh, be it politics or culture, um, mm -hmm. and that small mountain town uh, mentality. Um, mm -hmm. But you, uh, you write about your grandma though, who kind of uh, steered you in some other directions early in life. She did, and you know, the more I think about this, I believe what happened is that because I was a girl and a very shy and reticent child, I was just kind of left to my own over in the corner. And she just kept giving me books to read. So I wasn't taught to shoot a gun ever. I've never in my life shot a gun. I can't believe that. I'm, you know, I'm fifth generation Idahoan. And I don't know if I've ever even held a gun. But everybody else in my family has shot a gun. And um, they've hunted, they've rafted many times on the Salmon River. They've, um, my, you almost, my you almost died once on one of those trips. <laughs> I did. My my grandfather had a, a a placer mine that he would and a still in the woods, you know. And they are and a so, very very specific kind of western. Yes. Or, or westerner. Um, I mean, they really tap into a lot of. I don't want to use the word stereotypes, but a lot of these kind of mm -hmm. very old west, mm -hmm. very um iconic type of westerners. Your family checks all of the boxes. They check every box. And but you feel I like you check none of them. <laughs> I Very few of them. Very few of them. I mean, I love the place. I, As I said, you know, every time I go to Sam and I, I can't stop weeping for how much I love it. But um, and I, I loved being with my grandmothers there. I adored my grandfathers. They just didn't include me in very much because I think I, I probably gave off the signal that I didn't want to be included. Mm. So instead of learning how to shoot guns or ride horses and all those things, I learned how to read. And I read voraciously, and um, and I think it just allowed me to drift away in a certain manner that was unexpected to me and my family. Hmm. You write um, – I want to read one quick little passage here and then get your take on this. This is what you write at the end of um, – the first chapter, um, you write, no one had to say the words aloud. I knew my job as a girl in my family and my job as an Idahoan. Um, stay loyal to a certain set of values. Keep the government out and the guns close by. Remember that the land is your land to use as you want. Tromp into the woods, camp in the wilderness, douse the fires when you leave, organize your tools, clean up your waste, every last beer flip top and gum wrapper, and catch enough fish to jam your winter, free your winter freezer. Let no strangers in. Abide no strangers here. Now, the title, title of your book, I 
am a stranger here myself. At what mm-hmm. point in your personal life did you start to feel? So, I mean, if abide no strangers here, if that is a core value of of this region and the town where mm-hmm. you grew up, at what point did you start to realize that maybe you were on the wrong side of that? Gosh, that's a great question. I, I, I think as a kid, I just had, you know, the vague emotions. I couldn't put language to it, but I, I always felt like an outsider because, you know, again, when everybody said, you know, let's jump on horses and go spend the night in the woods, I was not me. You know, I, I was running the other direction. Um, so it just made me feel like an outsider. Um, but, I did feel like an insider with my grandmothers who just kept me close by and folded me in. Um, but I think when I went away to college and I realized I don't want to be the person that my parents have imagined me to be, I, I want to be my own self. And um, so I started going down a path that, that, that maybe they had some doubts about, but um and then, but then I did many of the things I was expected to do. I got married right away out of college, even though I really had some misgivings about that, some very strong misgivings. I wanted to do other things, but this was the path I felt like I had to take, mm-hmm. get married, have children. Um, and, you know, I, I absolutely love my children, so I'm glad I did it that way. But, you know, it was always kind of a mixed bag for me. Am I in? Am I out? Um, so trying to do what would please my family and denying myself, trying to please my family, disappointing, I'm trying to please myself and disappointing my family. It's always been just the seesaw for me. And that's one thing I wanted to figure out in this book. I think it's a seesaw for a lot of women, by the way. Um, who do I please my, my, my family and their expectations or do I forage off on my own? Hmm. Well, this might be a good moment to, to pivot a little bit to the Whitman story that you sure. you kind of use as a foil um, mm-hmm. to bounce your own story off. So the Whitmans, yes. these Methodist missionaries They're show They're actually up. Presbyterians. Presbyterians. Yes. Oh, man. My mistake. Um, Just because Narcissa would have a fit about that, I thought I'd say. <laughs> um, they head up to Oregon country. Um, what's the year that they arrive in, in Cayuse country? Yes, they arrived in 1836. I was struck throughout, and I, I assume this is what you were playing with, that you were wrestling with your own sense of being a stranger and not belonging, mm-hmm. um, and suggesting that maybe the Whitmans, in a multitude of ways, uh, mm-hmm. were outsiders and did not belong mm-hmm. in the West. They, they came to more tragic ends mm-hmm. um, than you have, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> can, can you give us maybe the quick like 60-second sketch of who the Whitmans are, what they do at their mission, how it all goes wrong. And and then maybe we can then step back again and and talk through what this means for you. Yes, thank you. So um, I mostly focus on Narcissa Whitman because she's, you know, she's just the other main character of this book. She, as a young child, was caught up with her mother in the Second Great Awakening, which was uh, a big religious movement through upstate New York and other places. And she was convinced at a very young age that her only role in life was to be a missionary. And she sought the way to do that. It's very complicated. And she finally met this man. Um, they knew each other for maybe a few hours before they got married and headed off to start a mission in the deep, dark, very scary West where nobody else wanted to go. Everyone else wanted to go to the Sandwich Islands or to Guam. And these folks said, we're going to the frontier West, which mm-hmm. they had no idea what they were heading into, except that Marcus had been there once before. Um, so they chose to, to settle um, on the other side of the blue mountains near current day Walla Walla, Washington um, among a tribe called the Cayuse, which is not their name. That's a French name for them. But the Cayuse had never asked for missionaries to come. They were a little bit curious that, but the Whitmans were convinced that they, that they were wanted, they were needed, that they'd been it had been requested that they come, and so they were prepared to have this huge flock of devoted followers. And the Cayuse just couldn't quite figure out what this was all about. Um, 
they were tolerant for a little while until they started getting sick dying, um, yeah. from and all their children started yeah, dying. dying from all their children started dying and also that the Whitmans just kept taking land from them and they were very unhappy about that and then the Whitmans were super judgmental I mean they there was no softness about them at all they they just battered these people with the idea of hell if you don't go along with our way of belief you will suffer eternally and the Cayuse just couldn't talk could stand it and anyway after 11 years and not a single conversion not one uh, a small group of Cayuse rode into the mission and killed the Whitmans as well as a dozen others um, and men and and boys they they killed some anybody any male over about 12 years old was killed um and they took the women and children hostage for a month raped the teenage girls um and it, it was just a, a a terrible horrible situation the hostages were um of course rescued and then the brand new Oregon territory government declared war on the Cayuse and uh, that was pretty much the end of that tribe, too. What drew you to this story, then? Because this is dark, dark stuff. Well, you know, it's dark, 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 yes. Me- several things um, made me interested in the story, that she was the first Caucasian woman to cross the Rocky Mountains, the first Caucasian woman to give birth to a Caucasian. This is what the history books tell us, anyway, a Caucasian child. Um, and I was really interested in this Jeffersonian notion they had that they could come prepare these tribes for the inevitable onslaught of settlers, including my family. And what happened instead was this awful collision, which um, just led to tragedy and death and bitterness. Um, So I, I read about Narcissa Whitman. I was taught about her as a child. I vaguely remembered her. But when I read the first book about her as an adult, I thought, this woman bears so much responsibility about what happened. And it's, you know, I felt like that story really hadn't been told. Well, Patricia Limerick tells it. And then how, how is her story presented to you as a child then? So you're vaguely familiar of her. This is part of like, you know, yeah. I'm assuming like you know, popular secondary education in, in, the, in the Northwest, mm-hmm. especially in Oregon. Um, so how, how was it presented to you as a child and how did it start to differ as you read more scholarly accounts. Oh, yes. Well, I um, learned as a child that she was a martyr, that she was the angel of mercy, that she was doing God's work and um, was killed for no reason, except that these killers were, you know, quote, bloodthirsty um, and that she bore no responsibility for what happened, nor did Marcus. I mean, they were held up as icons of the West, you know, the the, the people that we should all emulate and and cherish. Um, and so it was such a one-sided uh, view of, of what happened. And this was really the first large-scale murder of white people in the Pacific Northwest and the first murder, char- murder trial, excuse me, where five chiefs were, mm-hmm. um, you know, hung because of, of this episode. So, you know, that's what I was taught, that these bad, bad Indians killed these good, good white people. And um, and so what I read later from Patricia Limerick and and John Unruh and um, and especially a mad man named Nord Jones uh, in this book called The Great Command, which just informed me about so much, uh, is that, you know, Narcissa brought with her certain ideals and expectations and a very narrow vision that she was not willing to be flexible about in any way. And the the conflict between these two cultures just was going to lead to death. I was interested that you, you begin your book with the, I mean, the opening vignette is the, the massacre. You start with, you, you kind of spoil the ending at the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. You open with this, this, scene of carnage um which well no I'm, I'm sorry this is not your opening vignette but uh early in the book after you're early in the book yeah right. after some of um 
some some other a few opening things. But that's that's the first we hear of the Whitmans is mm-hmm. um, you tell us how they end, um, mm-hmm. which I'm curious does that kind of imply that it was the only way it could have gone? Does it take mm. some of the contingency out of mm. out of their story? Wow, I really love that I- idea that you've just posed. Um, you know, I knew that it was going to be super easy to find out how she died. I thought I can't hold that out as one mm-hmm. of the tensions of the book. Um, the tension of the book is why does that matter to me? Mm-hmm. And so I thought, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put that right up front. So the reader knows that I'm not going to creep toward that inevitable day when they're all killed. You weren't trying to solve um, the murder mystery. Yeah. Um, right. There was yeah. no mystery here at all. The mystery is really, you know, wh- why am, why, has this cracked me open in some way learning about her. And I, I, I thought from the beginning that there are so many books about Narcissa Whitman. I have nothing new to say about her, but what I could do is use her as a pry bar to understand myself better as a woman in the West. And um, so I just wanted to get that picture of her dying in a ditch up there right away because that's where she was headed. What is it about her story then that that grabs you most? Is it this the incongruity between the ideas and practices she brought to the region? Is it uh, the I mean, and she she you know the, her family relations, her mm-hmm. religious relations, which also includes some of these other associated families. There's kind of that broader kind of social cultural world they're in with some other missions, or mm-hmm. how it all goes horribly wrong. Um, oh, then there's also these moments where um, Marcus is away for long periods of time mm. and she's on her yes. own. I mean, there, there's there's so much in her life. What what are the things that really mm-hmm. jumped out at you or that, that pried you open, as you just put it? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think what happened is that I, I started writing this book, oh, so many years ago, let's say eight years ago, thinking that I was going to write about what a, a bad influence she was, a, a negative force in the West. But what happened is I kept writing and writing and reading and studying is that a kind of tenderness found its way into me about her. And I became very curious about that. Why would I sympathize with this woman who really um, made so many mistakes and was so wrongheaded in my view about what was going on there? And I think what I what it boiled down to for me is this idea of being a stranger. And because I felt like a stranger as a child, I was extremely lonely and I didn't have a word to put to it, but now I realize um, I just felt lonely, and I I've had a lot of struggles with loneliness uh, in as an adult too, and um, and I realized that if I had to say one thing about Narcissa Whitman, it would be that she was absolutely organized by her loneliness, hmm. which she completely denied because she didn't believe she could be a servant of God and admit to her own fragility and loneliness. So she spent her life denying and denying what she needed most, which is to be loved and cared for and and recognized and cherished. Um, I think, you know, others are going to disagree with me. I think Narcissa and Marcus had a terrible marriage. I don't think they found solace in each other. And um, until she adopted seven children off off the uh, Oregon Trail because their parents had died. She really had no one to even lean on. Um, so I think that loneliness just opened a door for me into her. Uh, not that I'm going to claim that I know her. There's no way to know her. But I think I I relate to her what she went through. She was trapped. Her mother told her at age 10 or 11, you will be a missionary. Mm -hmm. And she could never imagine herself as anything but that. So she didn't get to doubt. And I think, you know, this is a plight, again, of so many women. You will be this. You will do this. And if you doubt, it means you're weak, that you're not going along with the program. And, you know, I I think when she even got to St. Louis, this is Narcissa, before they started the journey, I think she had a lot of doubt. She needed to go home, and she didn't. Um, and I've I heard think the doubt was also wrapped up that. in salvation. And 
Oh, sure. There, there was, there was so much on st- at stake. So much at stake. And she had promised her church, her mother, this yeah. whole religious movement that she was going to make a difference. And she had to do it. Um, and I know, you know, at the end of the book, I, I put in this letter that one of the Methodist missionaries wrote to Narcissa's sister about how this whole thing was a suicidal mission. He wrote that in the 1800s. I thought, yes, that's what it was. If you had come to these realizations or come to know Narcissa earlier in in your life, Mm. we don't need to reveal how old you are, but you've raised your children. Yeah. Um, Well, I'm I'm 60, so I'm I'm at grandma age. So you say you can you you connect or you you felt sympathy for her her loneliness and mm-hmm. part of this that she wasn't willing to face it in the ways that she needed to and address it, which to to me sounds like a moment of um, self discovery for you that you're realizing yes. things about yourself. Is that something that you had come to realize yourself years ago and then were able to see it in Narcissa's story? Or is this something that you see in her story and you're now looking back wishing you had seen it in yourself earlier? I think it's the latter. You know, I, I of course, I've had lots. I've had men, many years to think about my own upbringing and who I've become as a woman, as, as a mother. Um, and, and, and my first memoir was very much about motherhood and how I had to reconcile myself to some idealism that I couldn't live up to and and failed miserably. So this book was more about, again, place. How 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 is it that I love this place with every cell in my being, and yet I don't feel embraced back by it? Um, and that's where my curiosity mm-hmm. started. I think what happened for me was when when I read a letter that's in the book, that Narcissa wrote to her father about her only child's death. So much shifted in me um, about her, about myself. Uh, and there's so much vulnerability in that letter that um, that for the first time I thought, oh, my gosh, she is a real human being who hurt and hoped and dreaded as much as I do. And uh that's where I felt that connection. And it, it really did make me think about myself in a different way as well. Mm-hmm. I love this idea that you mentioned that she was, you know, how, how is it that you can love a place so much, but not feel that it loves you back or that it embraces you. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, in, I'm, I'm reminded recently there were the, you know, these controversies about um, Elizabeth Warren and her claiming of uh, native heritage and all the, the, the native DNA things. Right. And, and some of the responses from some of the Cherokee communities were, um, you know, that, that Cherokee identity, it doesn't matter if you claim Cherokee identity. What matters is, does the Cherokee community claim you? Oh, so interesting. And that's where the authority in belonging comes, at least for that community. Yes. Like, does this community yes. claim you? And that's what really matters. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if region works that way. In terms mm. of does a region have to claim you? Um, so much mm-hmm. about place is determined by the ideas that we project upon it. Mm-hmm. And we have, you know, in Western studies, we're always talking about, well, who's the gatekeeper? Who gets to determine mm-hmm. um, not just who does and doesn't belong, but what are the parameters? What are the requirements for uh, being a true Westerner? Or we have, you know, debates about authenticity. Mm-hmm. And the more that uh, that we, de- we debate that kind of the less convinced I am by it. Mm. Um, I don't know if there is an authentic Western and especially as we move, um, you know, old West versus new West. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, to, to quote you again, you write, this actually might be at the very, very, this, I think it's from, at the very end of your book, kind of as you're coming to, an, you've come to the end of the Whitman story. You've kind of come to an end of, you know, you're pondering over your place in Idaho and you say, I'm still here. I'm still figuring it out. Somehow or another, I'm trying to make my way through a miasma of doubt to give permission to call myself a woman of the West, even on the days I can't quite grasp what that means. Do you feel that that, that you need permission to call yourself a Western woman? I think the permission inevitably, which I discovered by writing this book, comes from my own interior, 
nobody's ever told me in my family or otherwise you're not not you're not truly a westerner i i was projecting that from my father who i think uh you know is is kind of talk about foil i believe he's the real foil of this book where he's i feel so judged by him because i don't as you said earlier i don't tick off the boxes that he would hope i think his children would um so i have I internalized that as a child that I was a big disappointment uh, because I didn't play it out like my cousins did or other people in Salmon, Idaho. And so I hope what I've discovered in this book and from Narcissa, who who would never allow herself to be anything but a stranger. um, I hope that I learned that I have to give myself permission to claim what's always been mine. I mean, I was telling a friend the other day that, you know, I feel like I wrote some kind of version of Wizard of Oz, you know, that (laughs) there's no place like home. You know, she she has to say it herself before it's real. Um, And you need to be able to call Salmon home. I need to be able to call Salmon home. Uh, And I I I think I can now. I mean, it's um, it's the most important place on the earth to me. So. I, I get to say that and, and mean it. And, and I, I think as you using your language that I'm authentically from there. But I think for all of the kind of the Western tropes that, you know, you've listed off saying that you don't fit, there are so many that you do, you know, you know, in the West, we have these ideas about, you know, the r- rugged individual who mm-hmm. charts their own course and mm-hmm. to hell with the world. I'm going to mm-hmm. do what I want to do for myself. I'm going to buck right. trends. I'm going to be, right. I'm, I'm not going to be someone else's person. And mm-hmm. that, that comes out in a lot of your writing. I mean, and you, you bring it up as the source of why you don't fit, but in many ways that is a very, I mean, what more Western thing could you have done than to, <laughs> um, to truck off and, and do what you felt was right for you. Um, mm-hmm. also you, this, uh, fierce loyalty and love of place and land and landscape Mm -hmm. i think is a fundamentally if again if we're talking about kind of western stereotypes is a very western sentiment i think westerners are more attached to landscape and place than 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 people from other places at least that's the way i've read it as i've lived in different places and you're very western in that as well i could probably keep going but well, I, I appreciate that. I, you know, it's 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 really. It, I I so appreciate you, that you said that. It really is about my own sense of self, and you know, all the ways that I was filled with doubt and fear, and 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 that I just had to step over those hurdles and see myself as you do, as you have just so beautifully expressed, which is that I do have these qualities. Um, you know, I remember when I gave the first manuscript, the first version of this manuscript to my agent, and she read it, and she said. Oh my gosh, no one in New York is going to relate to this. This is, <laughs> you know, you'll never have any readers here. And I, I thought, wait a minute, you know, how come, you know, not that I'm comparing myself to Peter Matheson, but he's got readers everywhere and he writes, you know, about his place so distinctly. I mean, why, why is my place so, ha, have such strong boundaries around it that other people can't relate to it? Um, but maybe that's the case that, only people of the West understand these dilemmas of the West. Well, that's what, that's what some Westerners like to tell themselves. Mm. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, you you end the book with the, this scene uh, in Salmon that you're mm-hmm. in, I believe it's off season and you're in a restaurant mm-hmm. um, and a buck, uh, an elk or a deer. It's a, it's a deer. A deer gets trapped inside it like an enclosed patio and mm-hmm. is thrashing about. And then you, Right, that it escapes. It, right. It, it flies out the door. And I want, I know some writers don't, they don't want to unpack their, what they write too much or too explicitly, but uh-huh. I want to see if you will. You, you close <laughs> the book by saying, the buck ran hard and fast into the heart of Sam and Idaho, freedom in every expelled breath, and not once did it look back. Mm-hmm. Are you the buck or <laughs> are you, um, wishing you could be the buck? What, mm-hmm. what, what what does this image represent for you? You close the book with it. It's powerful. And I'm trying to, I, I can, myself seeing I can read this in a few different ways. And maybe mm-hmm. there are multiple ways to read it. What what are some of the ways that you think this plays for you? 
I'm I, I'm thrilled that you asked me this question because it puts me on the hot seat. <laughs> I have thought many times since the book was published even, what did I mean by that last scene? <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I I recently read uh, Jennifer Egan's comments from her pen speech this year, and she said something like, uh, the meaning of literature is ambivalence, or ambivalence is the meaning of literature. Maybe that was turned around. And I realized that I love this idea of ambivalence and that it's so human and that I'm going to kind of, you know, let myself off the hook somewhat about Mm. being ambivalent at times in the book because I am ambivalent. And I think that scene is kind of the quintessence of ambivalence for me because I one question I ask myself is even though it really and truly was a buck caught in that outside patio, why didn't I make it a doe? Um, and then I, you know, I don't want to lie in my book, so I, I'm glad I made it a buck, but if it was going to be me, shouldn't it have been a female, (laughs) but no, it was the buck with these antlers and he was thrashing about, I think what he represents to me is this idea of feeling that you're caught when you're really not Hmm. all these years that I have been caught in this idea of myself um that you just I had just, to step through that door i just needed to step through the door i feel the exact same way about narcissa whitman she was utterly caught by the sense of self that was created it was a construct but she couldn't get beyond it well to come full circle i mean it's kind of the idea that we said at the beginning about memoir versus autobiography that you know, I'm I'm curious, maybe in another 20 years when you, when someone asks you a question about this book, maybe you'll view the buck differently. Maybe, maybe. you know, I mean, that, that maybe that's the beauty of memoir, um, mm-hmm. the, the self-discovery that you have when you wrote it versus when you read it later or think about. I mean, I think about this when I read back through old journals and I think, mm-hmm. oh, wow, that's definitely not what was going on. Like the way I wrote it <laughs> down and, and the way I view it now is so different. And in mm-hmm. you know, 30 more years, it'll probably all read differently again. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, yes. th- th- these these moments we have in our lives um, speak to us powerfully uh, for, for very specific reasons at one moment and from the perspective of a different place in our lives, you know, might speak to us quite differently. There's, so there's, a, there's an ambivalence of a sub- subjectivity um, mm-hmm. to it. That I, I th- and I think that's that's the beautiful thing about self-reflection and, and, and yes. personal memory, right? I think so too. And I, I just want to add that one theme for me through this book was um, women's grief and how often women in the frontier, Narcissa, and my grandmothers, my great grandmothers, were told that to just shake it off, to move on, to not grieve. And um, there was no outlet for the expression of grief. And I think women have really paid the price for that. And so, you know, part of the release at the end also was that it's okay to both accept and grieve. Um, and I want to give myself and my daughters more permission to express our own grief. Do you think you would have come to this if you had not? I mean, because you're talking about release, which and I, mm-hmm. and, I mean, I, I love that that concept. Do you think it took writing it down? Is is that how you let it go? Yes, I think that strongly. I I, I don't believe that memoir should be written um, as an act of catharsis. I think that's a mistake. If catharsis happens to tap at the window and want in, hmm. fantastic. Uh, but we can't manufacture I it by can't manufacture yeah. it. Just like you can't, you know, just like a, a manufactured metaphor that clunks you on the head <laughs> um, is a is a mistake. I think writing for catharsis is not a good idea. That said, I, I remember with my first book, my youngest daughter came to me and she said, "Mom, why didn't you just sit down and tell us all of this?" And I said, well, I didn't know it till I wrote it, you know, and I it took many years of writing it to get to where I could talk to myself. I And I feel the same about this book. I had to write it and rewrite it and rewrite it again before I understood what I was trying to say to myself. Hmm. I, I learned um, I mean, I learned a lot about narcissist women that I didn't know. But um, this made me pause and think about. A lot of things about myself as well. My relationship with with place, with the region, um, but also, um, you know, more 
kind of personal things as well. So, yeah. Where did you grow up? Uh, Bellingham, Washington. Oh, on the border. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I was just there recently. Oh, great. Actually, I think I saw that on your book tour schedule or something. Did you speak up there? I yeah. did. That's yeah, a, yeah. I love village books and I oh, love yeah, that village. little town. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thank you for writing this. Um, thanks for well, thank spending you. a little time uh, with me uh, chatting. Um, do you have anything new in the works that you want to promote or mm. or do you want to uh, keep it a secret? <laughs> I, I'm i very slowly finding my way back to the page. This this book kind of take took the stuffing out of me, but I'm I'm a. Uh, well, any good project should, I think. Yeah. Yes. But I so appreciate talking about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again. And uh, enjoy the remainder of your summer in, in Oregon. And you too. All right. Thanks so much. Take care. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Rudd Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. You can find him at Micah D-A-H-L Anderson with an O dot com. I'll include a link in the episode description. Besides subscribing to the podcast, you can receive regular updates about upcoming episodes by following on Facebook or Twitter. My name is Brennan Rensing, and I serve here as the podcast host, producer, sound engineer, uh, and pretty much everything else. So if you have any praise or critiques, you should probably just send them my way. I'm Associate Director of the Red Center and an Associate Professor of History here at Brigham Young University. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions about the podcast, the Red Center, our live-streamed lectures and events, funding opportunities, or anything else. If you have books you think I should consider for an episode, please send them my way. One last plug, I'm also the project manager and general editor of a great digital public history project hosted here at the Red Center called Intermountain Histories. You can check it out by visiting www.intermountainhistories.org or download the free mobile app by searching Intermountain Histories on your Apple or Android devices. There you can read carefully curated histories of the region, complete with archival photos, bibliographies, and more. In any case, thanks again for listening to the episode. We'll see you next month.